Welcome to chapter five of The Voyage of the Frog. At nine in the morning, he eased off the tiller, let the bow spirit spirit come in, up into the wind, and the frog slowed to a standstill. The sails immediately began luffing loudly, flapping back and forth in the breeze. The sky was almost clear with a small fluffy bits of cloud moving across the blue and he shrugged his shoulders, shoulders to ease the stiffness. He had sailed straight on course, thinking of Owen and the art of sailing and, and, and getting the most from the wind. In just over 15 hours, his shoulders and arms were sore from pulling against the wooden tiller handle. Without the push of the wind holding her over, the frog almost wallowed in the water. The change in the boat and the whole boat was amazing to him. When she was selling, it was as if everything mattered. Everything was full and pulling and steady and taking the seas. But the instant she stopped sailing, it was as if she turned into a fat pig. The boom jerked back and forth. Ropes slapped like six snakes and the sails looked sloppy and loose. And she rolled from side to side on the smallest swell or wave like an old wash tub. He'd come far enough. He stood and looked in all directions and could see no land, nor plane, nor other boat, no indication that there was any other human on the planet. Rather than lying flat, though, it was only a mild breeze. The seam ceased to rise around him and away from the frog. It was as if she lay in the middle of a huge slate blue saucer or dish that went up and away on all sides of the horizon. There was a thing to do. He let the tiller hang. The frog was locked in irons, her head up into the wind, and would not be going anywhere. The cabin again smelled a bit of mustiness, and he opened the forward hatch and propped it open on its base. He felt the breeze come, scooping in and clearing the boat out. It had been a cool night, but the morning sun was getting hot, and he took off his windbreaker and put it on the captain's bunk. He couldn't help thinking that it was, it was Owen's bunk and turned back to the rear of the boat, stopped next to the galley area. The box with Owen's ashes was still on the shelf to his right. He caught himself pointingly, not looking at it. There was a thing to do and he knew he must do it, but he didn't want to do it. It was so, I don't know, it was so final somehow to put Owen into the sea. The instructions had been specific. Open the box and scatter the contents. David took the small box and went back into the cockpit. He positioned himself in the stern, one hand holding the backstay, the support cable from the top of the mast back down to the rear of the boat, and he stood for a moment, looking across the water, thinking of a prayer, not in words so much, but in thought prayer. When he opened the lid of the box, it was impossible not to look inside. The ashes were gray, rumbled mass, and they didn't even fill the box. All of it, he thought. All of Owen, the man who had danced in the sand with the girl, the man who had wanted to know all things, the man who would sit and talk to himself for hours, the living man that Owen had been was an inch and a half of gray ashes in a small wooden box. It was impossible, simply could not be. He looked again to the gray sky, took a deep breath that somehow shuddered him and he turned the box upside down on the stern. And the ashes spread in the water and strangely, now he did not cry, but he wished only to be gone. He was done. He turned away without looking, then as an afterthought through the box as far as he could, did not watch where it landed with a splash. Somehow the box angered him. That they would or, or could put all of Owen in it angered him. All of it, the cancer, the death, all of it angered him. For he wanted nothing now but to get the frog underway and sail away from this spot. He pushed the tiller over hard to the left. The frog was still locked in irons, heads up into the wind, but she was nonetheless moving a tiny bit to the rear. With the helm over hard to one side, she would slowly back around, side to the wind again, and he could get her sailing. Another thing that Owen had taught him, 
had to do all these things without the motor. But as, she held, but as he held the tiller over, he reached for the jib sheet to pull the sail tighter to take the wind when the boat came around, and that the sheet was caught on the front hatch where he'd forgotten to close it. Normally, he would have just dropped down inside the boat and lowered the hatch from inside, but one strand of nylon, a tiny strand from the jib sheet, was hooked on the top of the hatch and a screw head that he had have to go up to the cabin to unhook. That one small thing, that tiny thread hooked on the screw head, saved his life. Later he would wonder about it, about how the thread of the nylon rope came to be hooked that way. It had never happened before. And he would think of twists in his life, how something so small as a thread could save him. He let the tiller go, and with one hand on the wooden handrail that was bolted to the top of the cabin, he clambered forward, impatient to be sailing, heading home, away from this place in the sea where Owen's ashes were floating. At the forward hatch, he quickly unhooked the cock thread and dropped the hatch cover to its place. He had to be fastened tightly from the inside and, and stood to move back to the stern. The jib was luffing in great slats and hit him in the face so that it put his hand up to protect him, the hand that pushed the sail to the side, and he could see forward, over the bow, a great distance, because he was standing. And that's when he saw it, away to the north, close to two or three miles in the distance. The swells looked strange. The sky was clear, and the morning sun was off to his right, and he could see the well enough, but it still looked strange. It seemed as if the top of the cells were flattening somehow, either pushed flat or something else. I, I, what? Cut off? He stood on his tiptoes, silly, that as if raising himself an extra inch or two could help, but it was, it was automatic, and, and he squinted. Maybe it was the light, sunlight, or something cutting the water off funny? No. They truly looked different not flattened so much as is cut, as if a giant knife were cutting the tops of the swells and the waves. Without his consciously knowing it, the hair on his back moved up and his shoulders tightened. So strange. He'd never seen such a thing. He'd never even heard of such a thing. Odin had never mentioned anything like it. The waves were just cut off, clean. What would cut them that way? When? The answer came with the sound, an almost quiet moon mixed with a sharp tinkling that he realized was the wind pushing gray spray ahead of it in a kind of a horizontal, frothy rain. It was wind, a wild wind, a wind stronger than anything you'd ever heard, a wind without warning out of the Northwest. For precious seconds, he stood, the line of swells moving towards him stood and stared in disbelief. It, it just couldn't be wind. There were no clouds in the sky, no, no fronts coming, no signs of weather at all, yet it was there. Like a fool, he thought. I stand like a fool. It was a wind to take him, to kill the frog, and he had wasted time staring. He ran for the mast and released the jib halyard. The, the truth is that if such a wind hit the frog with all her sails up, for whatever reason, she would be driven over and down and sunk in seconds. The sound was louder now, a, a hissing moan that was almost evil resonance to it, but he didn't waste any time studying it. He clawed the jib down, wadded it into a ball, and with, with it still hooked on the forest day, he opened the forward hatch and jammed it all the, all the sail he could into the open. He pushed the hatch back down. It would not latch, but it would have to do for now. No time now, just seconds. He could smell the spray, the salt, the moistness being driven ahead of the storm. It must be a storm, some freak storm. He jumped back to the mast and untied the mainsail halyard. Normally, the sail would just drop on its own weight, but now the wind was getting stronger. He sensed, he heard the scream of it. His hair was plastered and blown to his face, and the mainstay upheld now by the pressure of the wind. He swore, grabbed at the sail, 
started to rip it down. Everything was noise, the wailing of a thousand screaming throats of the wind, the slapping of the sail sounding like a cannon. He felt one of his fingernails give on a seam and he kept tearing the sail down, the top of the hatch. He had to get the cabin hatch open. He moved along the boom, still pulling at the main, frightened to hold himself upright in the wind, fighting to hold himself upright in the wind and licked at the siding of the cabin forward. The kick made him stumble, and the, the wind picked up almost bodily and threw him out, away from the boat. But he tangled up in the safety life and caught himself and pulled himself back to the cabin top. The mainsail was slashing back and forth like a demon gone mad. He couldn't control it. Frantically, he attacked, pushing part of it down into the cabin through the opening of the hatch, almost to have the wind sweep it out while he was gathering more of it and billowing in insanity to push it down again. It was too late. There was a momentary part of a second pitch in the roar of the wind, a tiny hesitation in the full force of the storm hit the frog like a giant sledgehammer. David had a fraction of time to disbelieve the wind. So strong it sucked his eyelids away from his eyes and pushed the frog sideways, scuttling like a leaf. Then he tried to lean forward for the latch opening just as the spruce boom, 50 pounds of laminated wood and metal rail still attached to the main stealth, caught the corner of the storm and slammed across the boat like a big sweeping saber. It caught him full on the center of the top of his head with a crack that sounded like the boom had broken. There was an immense staggering, a flash of white, red color, somehow in the middle of him with an exploding pain that covered the whole top of his head like a burning glove. And he knew, as he fell down and forward into the top of the open cabin hatch, he knew it was too late. Chapter 6. He was in a great billowing white cloud, floating in whiteness, and there was this huge buckets of water being thrown on him. No sense to it. Screaming noise, ropes slamming against the mast, cracking of cloth being whipped or snapped. Everything so loud it hurt his ears. No, not his ears, but everything. Everything hurt all the time. Not just the sound, but all of it. Pain. Nothing but pain. Something was wrong with his head. Badly wrong. He couldn't think of it or make a thought pattern. It begin to work, just swirling. The white cloud and water on him, tons of water on him. And he went under again. Later, more pain, not just his head now, but his shoulders somehow, his shoulders and left arm down to his hand, water all around, he was covered with it now, with the white cloud in the water. How could that be? The frog, he was in the frog, down on the floor, on the, the cabin of the frog, but something was wrong, terribly wrong. Through the jolts of pain, he could almost see, almost think, and there was water everywhere, too much water. The frog was being driven and slammed by the waves, heating almost on her side, pitching forward and back to a nearly vertical position. Each time she was thrown by the storm, by the wind, the waves, she took more water in. The floor was awash with it. David was laying in water. Three, four inches of surging back and forth with the movement. The white clouds of the mainsail, he was face down in the water in the cell which he had fallen on. Yeah, that was it. He was in the frog and she was taking on water. Not good, he thought it that way. Not good, have to help. I have to stop the water. The front hatch, he raised his head, a new explosion of pain and focus on the forward part of the boat. The front hatch had come all the way down open, whipped open by the jib cell, which the wind had hit, hit. And every time it took away, water poured into the hatch opening. It would not be long before she floundered and sunk she could not hold much water without going down. He had to get up, move forward, and tighten the hatch down as much as he could with the sail still through it. Pinch it down on the sail. Stop the water. That's all there was to it. He had to do it. He tried to get up, but when he moved his left arm, there was a horrid popping sensation and a new slashing rip of pain that started and felt like his, in his shoulder, moved down his left arm and nearly put him out again. He took long breaths holding his head out of the water, sloshing back and forth on the floor, 
he had to get close to the hatch. It drummed in his brain, the scream of the wind. I've got to close the hatch. Using his right hand and his arm, fist as a lever, he pushed the front of the hatch, front half of his body up, fighting nausea and the roll of pain that took him. And with a matching motion, grabbed the sink, pulled himself into a crouch position. The boat nearly slammed him back down. Wave hit her like truck solidly, deeply, moving her back down in the face of him. And the motion seemed more violent when he tried to stand, like trying to climb a living, angry mountain. He stumbled right into the seat cushion, somehow still in place. And he pulled himself forward to the bunk of the bow, at the bow. He reached up for the latch, and it was driven down once more by a wave coming through that must have dumped at least 15 gallons of new water into the boat. Again, he tried. He got a hand on the hatch handle, only to be ripped away once more by the heaving of the boat. He was running out of strength, could feel it draining from him. But on the third try, he at last managed to pull with all his weight on the hatch and pinch it down around the jib sail and fashion the screw, screw down tighteners. Then he fell back on the bunk and was immediately dumped in the water on the floor again by the pitching of the boat. But it didn't matter now. He had done all he could do. Curled up in a ball in the water, trying to protect his left shoulder and his head at the same time, and he let unconsciousness take him. Time. He couldn't make out time work right in his thoughts. Indeed, he couldn't make his thoughts work right at all. Time seemed to telescope. It was dark when his eyes opened again, or partially opened, but it didn't seem to have been that long. Pitch dark, and the storm was, if anything, worse. The drawers had burst open, and there were tools and plastic silverware and plates and cups floating in the water. The noise, the slamming enormity of the waves was deafening. Waves thunder and crack when they hit the frog. He couldn't understand at first how it could be so dark. It, it seemed that he just fell back a few moments before, and now it was black night. His thoughts were jumbled, piled like waves on each other, and he couldn't believe that it, would, that it had been all day, a whole day in the storm. It just wasn't possible. He could still see almost nothing in the cabin. The ghostly white of the sail gave an eerie glow to the tiny space, but no real light. Water moved back and forth on the surges now, almost six inches deep when it sloshed against his chest. He fumbled with his right hand and found the end of the bunk by the side of the table. There was no power in the arm, and it took him four tries to pull and pull his way into the bunk. He heard a faint sobbing over the shriek of the wind in four seconds. For a th second thought, there was somebody else in the cabin. Then he realized that it was him making those noises. Animal sounds. Breath mixed with spit and fear and pain. He jammed himself back into the corner of the bunk against the sink. And immediately went under again. Sleep numbness came in a drug-like release that took him down. He had a tiny thought that the frog just couldn't take any more crashing, a fleeting worry. And he was gone, spiraling into the noise and pitching into the madness. Silence. Silence and some warmth that he didn't understand he, or he thought or felt that he was dead and it was no longer bad being dead. Everything was still and quiet and the pain had settled into a dull throb. Then he moved his head and almost screamed. The top of his, the top of his head had been jammed back into the corner where the side of the boat met the sink stand. And when he moved it, everything inside seemed to come loose. A flash of intense, jolting agony took him, overwhelming dizziness. And he passed out once more, but only for a few seconds. And when he came again, his eyes opened. Oh, he couldn't help the sound. The sun was bright, brighter than he'd ever seen, and it cut into his eyes, into the center of his mind like a white knife. He pinched his eyes closed again, opened them slowly, let the light in a little more slowly. It was day. He couldn't say for certain what time. Sunlight streamed in through the cabin windshields, slashed across the whole middle of his body. 
maybe maybe mid afternoon. That was why he felt so warm. His pants still soaked were steaming as the moisture left them where the sun took the fabric. So he wasn't dead. It just felt that way. His temple still throbbed with the light, but as he became more accustomed to its sharpness, he opened his eyes more and more carefully without moving his head. He swiveled his eyes to look at the, at the boat. Ah, he whispered. The interior of the cabin was shambles. The only cushion still in place was the one he was lying on. All the rest were tossed every which way. Everything that had been stored under the bunks had been thrown clear, which didn't make any logical sense to him. To have this happen, the frog must have gone almost completely upside down. How could she have done that without sinking? The contents of the drawer were strewn everywhere about the boat. Cans of food sloshed at eight inches of water on the floor. A roll of toilet paper was turning to white mush next to a ruined small box of sugar. Packets of tea were floating in the folds of the crumpled mainsail that hung down through the top hatch, staining, staining the water with brown clods. The stove had come loose under its mount and had been flung across the cabin and was jammed against the wall on the opposite side. The sail bags, which had been tucked neatly up in the front of the bow, had come loose and were scattered all around, wet but seeming to be undamaged otherwise. There was clutter everywhere, just junk. He hadn't thought there could be so much garbage in the boat, bits of paper, styrofoam cups, small pieces of cardboard. The boat looked like a garbage dump more than anything else. He saw that without moving his head, letting his eyes slide back and forth. Even that effort hurt somehow. So when he at last had to stand to go to the bathroom, he tried it in small stages. First tiny movements as he pulled his head down and out of the corner, wincing with pain. Then his right arm, it seemed to be the only part of him that didn't hurt, grabbing the table to pull himself upright. After a minute, he was sitting on the cushions, heaving a bit, weaving a bit. The pain in his left shoulder was easing. He guessed that he must have dislocated it when he fell and that the violent action of the boats must have popped it back in again somehow. But still, his head ached at the top. He lifted a hand and was surprised to find caked blood and a raised ridge of line across the middle. The boom had really smacked him, but he was lucky he hadn't been knocked completely off the boat, but he hadn't thought it had cut him. He pulled himself to a crouch position and then standing position, moaning quietly and he shuffled in the water to the rear hatch scooching around the main stell, which was hanging down, still filled the opening. It took him a full minute to slowly get up the two steps, bite off the mainsail again, and position himself at the stern so he could go to the bathroom. The sun and the sea were dazzling. The sky was an intense blue with a hot, flat sun across overhead. He thought it might be noon, but could not think of what day it was, and there was absolutely no wind. Not a breath disturbed the oily surface of the low swells that slid gently beneath the frog. The water had a metallic quality to it, a steel blue in contrast to the sky. It seemed to be giving off a light of its own that cut into his eyes. Heavy with water, the frog wallowed in the swells. It had none of the thickness and lightness he was used to. And while he hung on the backstay of the stern, all of it hit him at once. He was thirsty, hungry, and the boat was still near sinking, and he didn't know how long the storm had lasted, and he didn't know where he was, and he didn't have a radio or even a watch now. His digital wristwatch had lain in the water while he was unconscious and had filled and stopped. It was supposed to be waterproof, good at 600 feet of something, right? Slowly, he opened his eyes and looked around at the horizon winter again with new movement. There was nothing sticking above the water as far as we could see. Nothing at all. He was completely blown.